The Philippines has elected a new president. Is China the big winner? Welcome to China Uncensored. I'm Chris Chappell. The Philippines has elected new leadership. Meet President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. and Vice President Sara Duterte. If those names sound familiar, it's because Ferdinand Marcos Jr. is the son of Ferdinand Marcos Sr., the dictator who ruled the Philippines for two decades. Most of that time he kept it under martial law. And Sara Duterte is the daughter of current outgoing President Rodrigo Duterte. In other words, dynasty. The pair will take office at the end of June for a single six-year term. Now, if you're watching this from the Philippines, I love you, good luck, I miss you, and your giant Christmas chickens. If you're anywhere else in the world, let's talk about what it means for you. The Chinese Communist Party is happy. For context, the Philippines was a U.S. territory in the early 20th century until it gained independence after World War II. Ever since then, the U.S. has had a big military presence in the country, which is important because the Philippines is geographically close to China. But complicating all this is that the Philippines has also been moving politically close to China, particularly under President Rodrigo Duterte over the past six years. Rodrigo Duterte nurtured closer ties with China and Russia, while at times railing against the United States. And now his daughter, Sarah, will be the Philippines' new vice president, alongside President Ferdinand Marcos Jr., also known by his nickname, Bong Bong. Side note, what's up with cute nicknames for Filipino presidents? Marcos Jr. is Bong Bong, Duterte was Rodi, President Aquino was Noi Noi, and President Ario was GMA? Okay, not everyone gets a cute nickname. Anyway. Bong Bong's father was a brutal dictator who killed and tortured thousands of people, and had also tried to move politically closer to China. So what's President Bong Bong's stance on China? And why does it matter for the rest of the world? More after this commercial break. Welcome back. This is Ferdinand Marcos Jr., the president-elect of the Philippines. He takes office at the end of June. And his presidency complicates U.S. efforts to counter China. Marcos has been short on specifics about foreign policy, but in interviews, he said he wanted to pursue closer ties with China, including possibly setting aside a 2016 ruling by a tribunal in The Hague that invalidated almost all of China's historical claims to the South China Sea. His perspective seems to be that the Philippines simply doesn't have the naval or diplomatic power to enforce its own claims. I can see that. When I went to the disputed Scarborough Shoal in 2016, I saw tons of Coast Guard ships from China, but from the Philippines, only small private fishing boats. And on top of that, the Philippines doesn't believe the U.S. will necessarily come to its aid in a territorial dispute with China, because the U.S. didn't come to its aid 10 years ago during the last big dispute. The Philippines had taken its territorial dispute to The Hague for arbitration. And in 2016, the court decided in favor of the Philippines rejecting Beijing's claims in the South China Sea. But Beijing just ignored the ruling. And then President Duterte decided, if you can't beat him, join him. And President Marcos Jr. is probably going to continue that strategy. As he said on the campaign trail, allowing the U.S. to play a role in trying to settle territorial spats with China will be a recipe for disaster. And Duterte's policy of diplomatic engagement with China is really our only option. And of course, China wants that too especially if it means the Philippines moves away from the U.S. Marcos's biggest campaign rival was Lina Robredo, who was vice president under Duterte. Which I know may seem to you like a you-have-to-vote-for-one-of-us scenario, but Robredo had said during the campaign she would seek stronger ties with Washington and distance from Beijing. And I know what a candidate says during their campaign and what they do once they get into office have as much to do with each other as potatoes, and underpants. But the win for Marcos is definitely China's preference. 
And during the campaign this year, Marcos met with the Chinese ambassador to the Philippines, tweeting afterwards about strengthening their country's relationship. Over the past six years, China had offered to invest billions of dollars in roads, bridges, and other infrastructure in the Philippines. Marcos said he would resume Duterte's Build, Build, Build infrastructure program and suggested that Beijing's support was important for that. Which makes sense, the Philippines does need investment. And under Duterte, not enough investment was coming from the U.S. It's partly because Duterte pushed the U.S. away. The U.S. was not super happy about, for instance, all the extrajudicial killings, which Duterte confessed was really his only sin. Sure, he killed thousands of people without due process, but at least he didn't steal money. The Chinese Communist Party, on the other hand, is totally cool with extrajudicial killings. I bet they could even offer some tips. But there's also a pitfall of relying on the Chinese Communist Party. Breaking promises is their superpower. A lot of the infrastructure they promised failed to materialize. One political science professor told CNN that in reality, China was not reciprocating President Duterte's charm offensive. China's pledges of investment, which were largely illusory, made Duterte make a lot of geopolitical concessions, adding that in the meantime, China continued to press its own claims. So China pursued territorial claims with trillions of dollars and the Philippines got a bridge. This is bad news for the Philippines, but it's also bad news for the West. The South China Sea is a major route for international shipping, and if the Chinese Communist Party truly controls it, they can tax or block international commerce arbitrarily. They could also get access to valuable underwater oil and natural gas reserves, and more dangerous, if the Philippines gets too close to China, they could kick out the U.S. military. The U.S. has more than 20 U.S. bases and military facilities in the Philippines, which will come in handy if China starts a war with Taiwan, which has no U.S. military bases. President Duterte has repeatedly threatened to end the military deal with the United States, although he never actually made good on that threat. But if President Marcos does, it could spell big trouble for the U.S. and its allies in the region, especially Taiwan. If Taiwan falls, all of Asia will quickly fall to increasing Chinese Communist Party control. That includes, of course, the Philippines. So will Marcos be the kind of president who cozies up to the Chinese Communist Party? Well, we don't know. I suppose it depends on whether he's stupid. And now it's time for me to answer a question from one of our supporters. This question comes from Ringleader on Patreon. Everyone knows that the CCP doesn't currently have any jets that can take off from their carriers. And since the CCP Navy has no combat experience at all, why should Japan and Taiwan be nervous about them? Well, good question. Well, you're right that the PLA Navy doesn't have recent combat experience, but neither do Japan or Taiwan. And the PLA Navy does now have jets that can take off from their carriers, even if they do look stupid doing it. The biggest danger, though, isn't their aircraft carriers or fighter jets. It's their missiles. The PLA has done a great job of using stolen technology to build really excellent ballistic missiles and hypersonic missiles that can sink ships or destroy ground facilities from afar. They lock onto their targets automatically, and they're very hard to intercept. So in a war with China, those missiles are going to cause a lot of damage. Thanks for your question, ringleader. And thank you for being a member of our China Uncensored 50 Cent Army. That's our fans who support us through the crowdfunding website Patreon or the social media platform Locals. The links to both of those are below. Your contributions are the reason we can continue making this show. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. Thanks for watching China Uncensored.